We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. My name's Gerald. I'm Andy. And I'm an ace. And we're going to discuss, what, is this like your fifth or sixth literary short story, Andy, on the show? It is. And, something like that. Huh? And based on all your chatter and slack, you like this one too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, a big fan. But here's the thing. It's it's been pure chance, and I feel like I like not the same things that you guys like about them. And we're gonna we're gonna okay. hit something soon. Okay, but listen, listen, that only proves my point more, right? You came in here as a literary fiction skeptic, and so far you like everything except Skylight Room, which none of us liked. But you were the most generous with it. You gave it the highest score, and you tried to find the most stuff to like about it. And you just said we like these stories for different reasons. So doesn't that just prove out that these stories have a lot to offer for all kinds of readers, no matter what they're looking for? No. Mic drop. <laughs> Mic drop. It does not. Mic drop. <laughs> all right, you've done how many episodes of this show now? 154, this yep. is. All right, so I like five of them. <laughs> you don't know if you like the other ones. You haven't read the whole back catalog. Well, we'll see then. <laughs> All right. Just just accept what it is and move forward. It's it's going well so far. Yeah. And and bad. like to be fair, there's stories we haven't liked on the show, but even when we don't like it, it's kind of fun to trash them. Except there was one that to this day makes me mad that I read it. But other than that one, it's been fun to hate when we hate them. Well, well, look, we'll see what we see. All I know is it's increasingly likely that this will be my last appearance on the show <laughs> once I am not invited back for sharing my hot take on <laughs> So you have a hot take about this particular... Wow. I have an incredibly hot take on the second bakery attack that I don't know how welcome it will be, but I feel in my heart that it's true. I, I kind of went down a rabbit hole on this one. Oh, I'm excited. A hot take rather than a hot take away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So let's find out whether or not this is Andy's last episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So right. here's the summary. If you haven't read the story yet, uh, pause the podcast, go read the story, scratch your head a bit, and then come back. Uh, we follow the story of two unnamed characters in Tokyo, newly married, but with a sudden and ravenous hunger which woke them both from sleep one night. They had nothing to eat in the house, and the male character tells a tale from when he was younger, where he and a good friend attacked a bakery for bread. There, though, we made to listen to... <laughs> <laughs> Wagner. <laughs> Wagner, before... <laughs> I just crazy. <laughs> there they were made to listen to Wagner before giving whatever bread they wanted. They come to the conclusion that they had been cursed, and the only way to rid themselves of the curse was to attack another bakery. However, open bakeries are thin on the ground in Tokyo in the middle of the night, so they decide to rob a McDonald's instead, which they do, and they steal 30 Big Macs, some of which they eat nearby. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Wait, can I guess your hot take, uh, Andy? Yeah, go ahead and guess. It's wrong. Your guess is wrong. Is it that no. Haruki Murakami hates Wagner? No. Okay. That's my joking okay. hot take. <laughs> good, good, good guess, though. Great guess. It's a hot take. All right. So what did you guys think of the story overall, Gerald? I, I liked, I enjoyed reading the story. I don't understand it, but, but I... It's 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 a nicely written story and and um, yeah it's 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 okay. There's nothing objectionable about it. Objectionable about it. Did it make you laugh? Um, no, not really. Should it have done? It made me laugh. Did it? Yeah. See, that's that's the problem. You see, I, I, <laughs> I just, you see, I just magical realism way over my head. Yeah. Okay. I I, I just, thought, I, just as I was thought, I was getting to grips with it and starting to understand it. But bing, this story comes up, and no way. <laughs> then there's a volcano. <laughs> then there's a volcano, of course. Of course. Why not? So, Andy, did you like the story? Yes. I loved Why? it. Yes. <clears throat> it was just, it was fun to read. It it was funny. It It took me along this fun little adventure of robbing a bakery. I don't want to go too much further than that because I feel like once I start digging in, I'm not going to stop. Okay. Why All don't right. we hear your thoughts? I really liked it. Um, I think there's a few context clues that Haruki Murakami hates Wagner. I'm being a little cheeky about it. Um, 
I thought it was funny. I laughed when they're like gingerly tying up the three employees at McDonald's and asking if they're comfortable. And when they pay for the soda, they only <laughs> steal the Big Macs. Like we're only stealing Big Macs. We're only stealing Big Macs. We would like some sodas. We're going to pay for those. Uh, it was funny. Like that part was funny. And, and when the when they're robbing the place and the manager's like, sure, take the cash. Like we don't want cash. We want you to make 30 Big Macs. And he's like, you could just take the money though. And they're like, no, we want the Big Macs. It was funny. So... Uh, but let's try to get into what it's about, since that seems to be what um, Gerald's the most frustrated with right now. Uh, so the main character and his wife seem to me to be very different people. Uh, how would you guys, guys describe them? I, well, the, I don't. You, you take it, Andy. I, I, well, <clears throat> main character seems like a pretty reasonable guy who just got cursed one day. Mm -hmm. Um, wife's Allegedly. weird. We don't even know. Well, he definitely got cursed. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you more. Okay, wife's weird though. Like, all right, so the wife is the same person who says, "Oh, well, you can't go out to eat after midnight. Like, that's a that's a rule of society." But also has ski masks and a shotgun in her car. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's consistent. Actually, it's not weird. You can't go out in polite society after midnight unless you're a criminal. Then it's totally <laughs> game. That's criming time. So if you're going out to do crimes, you seems better fine. do crime if you go out yeah. after midnight. If you go out after midnight, you better be committing a crime. Oh. <laughs> Very consistent. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think for me, the difference between the two characters. And maybe it's because I've read so much Murakami. It's like I start to like know what I'm supposed to be paying attention to. I really like Murakami. So the main the main character, he, for the very top, he's like, sometimes things just happen. There's no right or wrong. He's very much a life will drag you by kind of person. And you're just along for the ride and nothing matters. Like that's very much his attitude about life. He doesn't even think he got cursed, right? But it's his wife who is the one who's more action oriented. Like she's the one who's like, you know, she hears a story and what's her instinct? She's like, that's a curse. Let's go lift that curse, right? Like she, she's more, um, she's a doer. She does believe in decisions. She doesn't think life just drags you by. Uh, so I think that there's a, an interesting contrast there. She's the person who has the shotgun. We don't know why. It doesn't matter why. She's down to do a crime to lift a curse, right? Like he would never think to do that. Had to come from her. Well. I would challenge you on that, Anais. Go. I'm going to go. Just do well, the monologue. Go for the hot take. All right. So first off, he is the one who initiates discussion of a curse, right? He's the first one who says the word curse. He was initiating discussion of a curse. No, but he says the word curse. First time the word curse comes out of someone's mouth, it's his mouth. Okay. Second <laughs> off, he used to do stuff, case in point, the original bakery attack. Was it his idea or his friend's idea? I can't remember. Eh, he did it. <laughs> right, but did he go along with someone else's master plan, though? Well, he didn't specifically ascribe it to his friend's action. Okay. I feel like we can charitably say he used to rob bakeries, and now he doesn't unless someone makes them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Well. So, mm -hmm. like Gerald, I was trying to figure out, well, okay, so what's, what's this story about? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't like, okay, so at the end of it, the volcano's gone and now he's drifting on the sea again and nothing matters. Is that good or is that bad? What are we supposed to make of that? So I figured I'll work backwards. Mm -hmm. What's the curse? And then we'll know what's bad and we can figure out what's good. So obviously the curse is he went to law school and started studying for the bar and worked for a law firm. Mm. That's a curse. I'll tell you that right now, undeniably. <laughs> undeniably. <laughs> Andy's speaking you don't from personal that. experience. Yeah. Right. Andy, having gone to law school, worked at a law firm, hated it, and then quit, is likes to go around and tell, didn't weren't you gonna be a tutor for people who's taking the LSATs and your advice to them was don't go to law school? Yes. That was your one job as a tutor. <laughs> yes. I did yeah. that. Uh mildly successful. Yeah. Because How many people did you persuade not to go to law school? Nobody, but I took all their money and uh -huh. pre prepped them for the test because what are you going to do? I did <laughs> <Okay>. my best. <laughs> <laughs> um. So if that's the curse, he used to have this cool life where like, yeah, he was starving, but he was getting by with his buddy on their wits, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's all right. So that was the good life. Then he got cursed, got married, went to law school. So I'm like, all right. So then what's the curse? And obviously the curse is from Wagner. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, it so, is. Yeah, no. Murakami hates Wagner. I think Murakami does hate Wagner, but that's not the hot take. Okay. <laughs> wow. It's, it's, you're giving this a big build up. It better be yeah. good. So then I was looking, I was like, okay, so uh, so I was reading online, a lot of people like, oh, the Flying Dutchman. And it's about this guy who's cursed and he gets married and he lifts the curse. And then Tannhauser also is about this guy who gets cursed and then true love sort of redeems him. And like, so they're operas and they end with everybody dead anyway, but there's a redemptive love lifty curse thing. Mm. But that's clearly not what happened here because at the end of the story, he's married and still works at the law firm curse intact. <laughs> wow. And that's when I found Very good. another great work that specifically utilizes both the overture of Tannhauser and the overture from the flying Dutchman. Okay. And that is Chuck Jones, 1957 masterpiece. What's opera doc. Okay. Wow. You went in. Yeah. In what's opera doc, a Viking hunter and warrior played by Elmer Fudd Mm -hmm. is out hunting a rabbit. Mm -hmm. They sing, they dance, rabbit runs away. Uh, dresses up as Brigitte to his Siegfried, they fall in love. And then after he proposes, the hunter finds out that the wife is actually a wascally wabbit. What? What? So I think if we view this as a retelling of what's opera doc, Uh (laughs) he made a mistake, right? Because when Elmer Fudd found out that the wife was actually a, a wabbit. Uh, he, you know, like he killed the wabbit and mm-hmm. had some, some regrets, but ultimately, you know, that's what you're supposed to do with wabbits if you're a wabbit hunter. Mm-hmm. Um, but our guy, our unnamed hero, he just goes along with this this second bakery attack. So you're saying instead of discovering that his wife is a wabbit, he's discovering that she's a criminal who has guns and right. so it has a similar yeah. level of reveal here right and he should have got out he should have got out but like, he oh didn't. everything you're doing is crazy let's 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 get out of here right and then also abandon his life at the law firm that's important it's very important okay interesting wow wow well, it's hilarious. now here's the thing uh-huh. the hunger right mm-hmm. they wake up hungry mm-hmm. and she ascribes the hunger to the curse mm-hmm but he says the last time he was hungry was before the bakery attack. That's yeah. what inspired the bakery attack. The hunger is independent of the curse. Mm. But it might not be. Mm. So I say Murakami hates Wagner for a different reason. All if right. you're getting cursed, this is some sort of Faustian deal that you made where you're getting what you want, but at what cost? So what did they have to get up to get the bread in that first bakery attack? They had to watch Wagner and then they get cursed. So the curse could be you came here because you were hungry. I'm cursing you now to be hungry forever. You know, like it's one of those kind of things. But like, what do they have to give up to get bread? They just had to watch an opera. And like, now you're cursed because you watch this opera. That's why I'm like tongue in cheek, like Murakami hates Wagner. Um, you know, what? Why are you grinning? <laughs> no, I just wow. seems legit. I don't know. I disagree. Yeah, but okay. But I think moving away from what's opera doc, Elmer Fudd and the Waskley Wabbit. Uh, we, I see what you're saying. This is kind of funny, but I think mostly it's because he he comes full circle, doesn't he? In the beginning, he just wants to for life to take him wherever like i mean even the fact that he kind of just like goes to law school and marries someone he doesn't seem to know very well seems like somebody who is who is letting life take the lead and drag him around and when he has this uh hunger it's a moment where he's like getting up from his boat a little bit looking down and seeing like oh my god like he's feeling threatened in some way and maybe it's a it's like the threat of like the the way that his life has become so mundane, right? Because like, how does he break free of this volcanic threat? It's by like doing something unexpected and spontaneous. It's by going with his wife and and um, 
sticking up a McDonald's and then he returns to the calm he prefers, which is just lying in a boat, completely unaware of what's beneath the surface, not caring what's beneath the surface and just letting the currents take him where they will, the currents of life. So there's this sense in like um, the state of life he's most comfortable in is not asking questions, not looking too deep, letting life take you wherever it leads and you don't resist. But in the, that one moment where he actually does sort of look down and he has this panic, the only way to break free of that um, it's not described as a panic, but it's described as something extremely uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. It's a hollowing in his chest. Um, uh, is by doing. Is the one time that he and his wife do something that's uh, a choice that they make. That's how he breaks free of that. Right. Like there's a there's a, a tension between making choices and not making choices throughout the story. Gerald See. seems unconvinced. <laughs> I I prefer the Wesley Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. I, I yeah. I I su I don't know. I, I I think it's possible. I think. I mean, I was just reading back, and and um, Andy's right um, because he says uh, da, da 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 da. I had it a minute ago, um, and. Oh, hang on. Da, da, da. Yeah. So, so yes, you had a problem. I rubbed my eyes again. Sort of. Nothing you could put your finger on. But things started to change after that, the first bakery attack. It was kind of a turning point. Like I went back to university and I graduated and I started working for the firm, studying for the bar exam and met you and got married. I never did anything like that again. No more bakery attacks. So, so that did change his life. And yeah, I think you could be right. I think that that cursed him and and sent his life on on a different path and and maybe i don't know maybe something's happened you know why has this started again what why has he woken up hungry and they've um yeah because because it's uh yeah all he wanted to do was us to listen to the wagner lp from beginning to end it was like the baker put a curse on us so it's he did bring the curse up first of all. Um, so I don't know. Right, but the way he's telling the story, again, go back to the beginning. At the very beginning, he says, um, wrong choices can produce right results and vice versa. I myself have adopted that the position that, uh, in fact, we never choose anything at all. Things happen or not, right? And the way he tells the story of the second bakery attack, it's like it's something that's happening to him. He just finds himself holding a gun wrapped in cloth that his wife gave him. Like when he says that the baker cursed them, he says it from this point of resignation, like that's our fate, so what? And it's his wife who basically believes that something can be done about it. Well, obviously all we have to do is rob another bakery and then it'll be solved, right? Like she's the one who isn't resigned to just accepting that fate. And he's very much about accepting fates and she's not, right? But he tells his whole story as if he's like a passive part of, of this. He's not really um taking any sort of ownership for this he's just sort of standing there as she does everything she ties everybody up i'm not sure who makes the demands i'd have to go back to check but i'm pretty sure it's her though yeah i'm pretty sure it's her she's the one really taking the reins here um and by the end of it though like when i say he comes full circle i don't necessarily mean he comes full circle like he righted himself more like by the end of it, he is satisfied because he's back on his little boat, not looking at the depths. He hasn't changed his world's view in any way, right? See, like he has, he hasn't been changed. But that's the curse. When he start, the whole thing's a flashback talking about in the early years of his marriage. Mm -hmm. Floating passively is the curse. That's what led him to going to law school and marrying. Oh, this I woman. see. So the curse is his passivity. Right. That I, that volcano was scary, but it was it was good. He was alive mm -hmm. when you're on the peak of a volcano looking down. Mm -hmm. But it filled him with a hollowness. So again, well, that could be part of the curse. You go fill that with action. Yeah. And by the end, remember the wife is still saying that the robbery absolutely had to be done. Like there was mm -hmm. no other way. Like both yeah. of them seem very stuck in their world views. But taking your argument then, Andy, that the curse is his passivity, and by the end, he's waiting for that boat to carry him where he belongs. Yeah. The curse then was not lifted for him. That's correct. I like that hot take. <laughs> <laughs> Took a while to really get what you were saying, but I like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it it is his wife who who says. 
you know, maybe it's not a curse, maybe it's just me. I said and smiled. She did not smile. No, it's not you. What can I do about it? Attack another bakery right in a way. Now it's the only way. So she's the one saying, This is what we've got to do, obviously. Right. Just where he's just resigned. Things yeah. are as they are. Yeah. Yeah. Got to get up early in the morning for work. Yeah. yeah. I love that idea, though, that the curse is him being passive, and that's why he goes to law school. <laughs> that's why people go to law school. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, I feel like we discussed the heck out of the story then with that amazing hot take very wow. quickly. That's very good. Well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he did research too, did Andy, and into wascally wabbits and everything. So I did a significant amount of research. I yeah. had to find out when Betamax was introduced so that we could set the story. <laughs> yes. It was um, written in 93, 1993, this story. Mm. So, um, so Andy, did you find what's Opera Doc on YouTube or something? Should we link to it? Oh yeah, I mean it's available on Vimeo. Oh uh, okay, I can provide a link. Yes, we're gonna link to it in the show notes. <laughs> Go watch what's Opera Doc and see how the story's parallel until the end. Yeah, it's only like six minutes. It's so basically it's the, your, your argument is it's the same story with different endings. So this is an alternate ending to what's Opera Doc. Yeah. Can we please send this in? So um, he, Haruki Murakami has uh, Mr. Murakami's like advice column type thing. It's very whimsical and cute. It's like, yeah, it's like an online version of like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But you can, he does, it's an advice column he does that's kind of funny, but kind of serious. We should submit to him. Yes. <laughs> our... This is what his story is about. Like, sir, are you aware that your story <laughs> and what's opera doc are basically the same up until the ending? <laughs> <laughs> is, is this the one where he sings "Kill the Wabbit"? Kill that is the one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know it. Yeah, yeah, I know with it. his spear and magic helmet. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that one. <laughs> it's well, well regarded as one of the, if not the best animated short of all time. That's true. It does. Yeah, I've seen it several times. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Um, but Haruki Murakami definitely hates Wagner because <laughs> well, Wagner is certainly the source of the curse. But also, and so yeah. if you look at it, it's it's the idea that these curses are redeemed by, uh, you know, marriage, mm. right? Yeah, he's, he's got to he's got to get out of this whole scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his isn't redeemed by marriage. His well, wife thinks she did. His wife. That's because Wagner's tricking everyone. He's, right. he's propaganda of this curse machine. Mm. Wow. Wow. Wait, wait. Can you explain exactly for our listeners how Wagner is propaganda for the curse machine? Well, just, okay. Um, Tannhauser's about this singer-poet guy who is like, oh, shit, maybe I'll go live with Venus for a while or something. And then at the end... uh. He comes back to the real world and everyone's like, oh, man, get out of here. The girl you love fall in love with someone else. And then he's like, well, maybe the Pope will forgive me. And the Pope's like, no, man, like you can't just live with Venus. <laughs> uh, and then the woman he loved dies. And he's like, oh, man, that was my true love. Please, true love, forgive me. And then he dies of a broken heart. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Pope was like, oh, I'll forgive you when my papal staff grows new leaves and then some someone walks by and is like hey all these people are dead but the pope just uh sprouted some leaves on his stick that's weird so <laughs> so he is so you're, so you oh, so they died really but the love he felt for this woman once he recognized that is the truth is what redeemed him ultimately i see but in this story but that's there's a no trick that's a lie that's that's because wagner was lying why was he, wait, I don't get, I don't follow the lie part. <laughs> because true love doesn't redeem you. It's, it's just another thing that lets you passively go along in life. <laughs> and what he should have done was run away from everything and, and hung out with his bro and not, not had a job. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure I follow this time how this thing at all. This is definitely going over my head. I'm not saying how this one really specifically. Oh, all right, all right. Flying Dutchman. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know the opera specifically, but I know the story of the Flying Dutchman. Mm -hmm. It's a guy on a ship, ghost ship, cursed. But every seven years, he can put into port. Only once every seven years. Mm -hmm. And if he gets married while he's in port, 
curse broken. I see. That one has a more clear redemption through yeah. love. Yeah. Cool. Right. Okay. Wow. But in this case, he gets married. He does a second baker attack, and the curse is not broken. So it's a complete rejection of the idea that you will be redeemed through love. Because yes. at the end of it, if, if we accept that the curse is being passive, nothing has been lifted. But if we don't accept that the curse is being passive, that the curse is this hunger, then he was not really redeemed through love, redeemed through going along with a crime. With but the wife. hunger predates the curse. The yeah. hunger led to the curse, but the hunger was first. Yeah. He only heard Wagner because he were hungry. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. See, that hunger is a hunger <laughs> For life, for and doing that, things. It is a hunger for life for doing things. I do see that. I do see how the hunger comes and it's when his image of what's beneath the ocean is much more explosive than uh, what he normally sees. Um, and that hunger has that magical realist quality to it as well, where it's not just hunger as you and I understand it. It's something almost supernatural. Yeah. And I Did see you your take. We're like, oh, oh, yeah, but then they do a thing. But he doesn't really do a thing. Yeah. The wife does a yeah, thing. Yeah, the wife does a thing, and he's just like, I'm holding a shotgun now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like you do. Like you do. <laughs> yeah. So how do you guys feel in general about a story where the story is, here's a man who's completely passive. He has an opportunity to do something, kind of doesn't really do something, and is happy going back to being passive. <laughs> Why not? I, I mean, <laughs> we can't all be heroes, can we? So, some people are got to be, some guys are got to be passive and just float along, and that's that's okay. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think it makes a good story, but but you know, it is. Yeah, it, it kind of. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Either. I think it sort of does make a good story in the sense that I like any time you're look because it's a short story. Have a high, very high tolerance for zeroing in on something that in a longer format you'd be like that was not worth it right but in a short story you can get away with this sort of thing where it's like you're looking at a certain trait of humanity a certain type of person and you're like you know what i know people like that or i see that um so it's it's illuminating in a way but this one is buried underneath so much uh just like whimsy and plot, like just the idea that they're driving around looking for a bakery at 2 a.m. and they're like, McDonald's, that'll do. Like, it's like a bakery. It's like a bakery. And even there's something about the heist itself that feels a little magical at times. There's the students who won't wake up no matter how much noise you make, <laughs> right? Like there's something like, it, it, almost like they're like a kind of fairy tale character, those random students who like, doesn't matter, the, the, the <clears throat> gate's coming down, it's rattling, nothing disturbs them. Um, yeah, it, it it feels fluffy. So it's funny when you have something so fluffy and then you're trying to bury something that's like an actual commentary on a type of person or a type of trait or something like that. It's sometimes hard to, to take that point very seriously when there's so much fluff, when this is a heist about 30 Big Macs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and his wife just look, looking through the actually there's, there's quite a lot to this story isn't there now the more you look into it, it there's um, there's a bit at, at the actual McDonald's robbery when um, he said you know we're really sorry we there weren't any bakeries open and she <laughs> says we're stealing bread nothing else she said so so she's rationalising this by they're stealing bread and that that's going to lift the curse. <laughs> Okay, but being realist for a moment. I know this is magical realist, and I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Okay. First of all, you're stealing more than bread, all right? <laughs> Second of all, lady, you keep a ski mask and a shotgun in your car or whatever it was that you pulled it out of. I'm pretty sure you're just, you just have a criminal heart, and you're looking for any opportunity to do crimes. Now, in a magical realist story, that's not the case, but in a realist story, this lady needs some serious therapy to get out whatever it is that makes her just impulsively commit crimes. <laughs> but she just, didn't take the money. She didn't take the money because she's not after that. She's after a different she's after thrill. It's yeah. not about the money. It's not even about the Big Macs. <laughs> <laughs> Which is weird. Also, he eats six Big Macs and she eats four Big Macs in one sitting. That's the most magical realist thing I've ever heard. Well, <laughs> uh -oh. I, really I can eat a Big well. Mac. How many? Uh, I, all right. I'll Six. tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Once when I was younger, um, we were going to McDonald's 
And my dad said, how many burgers do you want? And I said, well, give me, give me four quarter pounders. He's like, you're not going to eat four quarter pounders. You shouldn't eat four quarter pounders. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'll eat. I'm hungry. I'm really hungry. Let me get four quarter pounders. He's like, I'll tell you what. I'll order six quarter pounders. And if you can eat four of them, I'll give you $10. So I ate five quarter pounders that day. (laughs) I'm really glad you told this story that has nothing to do with that. (laughs) Now, I don't know the exact correlation between a Big Mac and a quarter pounder. Mm -hmm. I feel like I could put away six Big Macs if I needed to. All right. This story, because it's so whimsical and fluffy and insane, has made this discussion whimsical and fluffy and insane. <laughs> so here's the things we need to do. One, link to What's Opera Doc in yep. the show notes. Two, you need to go to a McDonald's and see how many Big Macs you can eat and film it. Just live stream it straight to yes. our audience on you our Facebook. It. That's what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> and three, we got to go contact Hookie More Commie and be like, do you know <laughs> your story? <laughs> yeah. You might not have realized this, but. You may not have realized this, but I just want you to know. I don't know. It was written in 93, right? Yeah. Maybe. Doc was 1957. Famous cartoon. I feel he's yeah. well acquainted. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's this kind of thing where no one has seen this connection before, and he's just waiting for someone to come <laughs> on. And he go, boom, thousand bucks. It's yours. Yes. You win <laughs> oh, the prize. What a dream. What a Maybe. dream. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's as real as anything else. <laughs> oh. Yeah. This is definitely our strangest episode ever, but I'm loving it. Yeah. <laughs> Madness. I'm loving it. McDonald's. McDonald's. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, jeez. Really? We're cracking up. Okay. All right. Listen, uh, I'm not sure what else to say about this story, though, <laughs> because I feel like we've already exhausted it to death. Very. I mean, it's been like a half hour, I think, but... I don't know what else to say. Like the writing style is very clean. I don't know if you guys have anything like else to contribute, but I mean, it was it. Yeah, it's good. It's clean. Yeah, it was a it was a joy to read. Yeah, mm. it's the whimsy. If you guys yeah. go to Rookie Murakami's blog, you'll be like, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> All of this makes perfect sense. Do, uh, do I have to? <laughs> you should. Yeah. yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. I will. Mr. Murakami's. What is it? It's really good. Um, his cats and stuff. Mr. Murakami's place. Yes. It's his advice column. Uh, it's good. Okay. It has cats and stuff on it. Did he already close it down? I don't think so. It came out a few years ago. It might have closed down. It might have been only a few months. Here. Oh, I have to link to this to the, the photo. Okay. The the blog header image is a cartoon drawing of Haruki Murakami at some sort of like cafe that's like, you know, there's a cat standing, a bipedal cat standing with a hand on the back of his chair and some sort of aardvark looking thing or anteater. And they're having a tea together. Okay. And that is the, uh, the photo. So it's exactly what you would expect from someone who wrote the story. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should use... With, can I use that photo for the the social media for the story with Whoa. proper credit? I credit it. <laughs> Should do. Fair use and all that. Yeah. All right. Anything else we want to say or should we wrap up and go to the game? Yeah. I think wrap up. I think it's yeah. my head's exploding. I know. The story was not. <laughs> also, listeners, please write in with whatever we missed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how many burgers you've eaten in one sitting. <laughs> Please live stream your Big Mac binging. <laughs> this is this is important. <laughs> okay, so it's a game time, Charles. It is. Um, before we do that, what do we want to submit for next week? So I'm submitting. I submitted a bunch of times last year, the year before. It's called Exquisite Corpse. It's named after this parlor game where everybody writes a piece of the story. So this one, it's 15 renowned authors, including Zadie Smith, Mohsin Hamid, who we just read on the book club, um, Joshua Ferris, who we've read on here before. They each contribute a different paragraph, and it's one short story. Wow. Mm -hmm. Sounds cool. Andy? Uh, So last week I submitted mostly as a joke because I knew Gerald kept submitting this story. Uh, Cream by Haruki Murakami. Okay. And I don't know. Now I'm kind of into it. Now I want to see what happens. Yeah. Right. Why not? 
Okay, so a couple of weeks ago we had a quiz about Japanese food, um, so I couldn't do that again. So <laughs> what you have to do is to tell me how many calories are in the following McDonald's meals. Oh my God! Look at this game. All right. Okay, and I've got a killer of a of a of a um, tiebreaker. So. <laughs> I just I'll do that anyway. Right. Okay. So where are we? Who's first? Andy, you're you're first on the list. Um, sausage and egg McMuffin, great breakfast meal. Is it four hundred and ten, four hundred and thirty, or four hundred and eighty calories? Sausage and egg. Sausage and four, egg McMuffin. Four hundred and thirty. You see, you know this stuff. <laughs> you're, you're you're a burger expert. That it is correct. So. Okay. Um, Anais, um, also breakfast, bacon, egg, and cheese bagel, or bagel if you so wish, 410, 430, or 480 calories, bacon, egg, and cheese 480. bagel. 480 is correct. You are experts of the golden arches. Um, Andy again. Um, so we have something perhaps a little bit more as a light lunch, a sweet chili grilled chicken wrap. 280, 340, or 390? You know what? I'm going to say 390. Is not correct. It's oh. 340. Uh, Anais, also for a light lunch, crispy chicken and bacon salad. 250, 280, or 316? 316. 316 is correct. Um, okay, speaking of Big Macs, Andy. A grand Big Mac bacon. I don't know if you have them over the hair over there. Uh, two patties, cheese, lettuce, onion, pickles, sesame top bun, and bacon. Is that oh. six 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 calories, seven 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 calories, or eight 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 calories? That's got to be lucky sevens. It is lucky sevens. Anais, a quarter pounder with cheese, a classic quarter pounder with cheese. Is it five hundred eighteen, five hundred thirty eight, or five hundred fifty eight calories? Uh, the first one, 518. Yes, you're correct. Um, okay, so something sweet to finish with. Andy, chocolate muffin, 368, 468, or 568 calories? 568. Wrong again, it's 468. Oh. So Anna East wins, um, but I'll ask her anyway. An Oreo McFlurry. Oh. 267, 317, or 367 calories? 317. No, it's 267, but you win anyway. Tiebreaker. No, no, no. You, but the tie, you win. Yep. Yeah, but, yeah, but we want to know. Yeah, tie I'm very breaker. excited. Okay, you should be. <laughs> your, your mouth's <laughs> got to be watering at this. Uh, a, a chain of, of pub restaurants near to here introduced a meal which was. A double donut burger. So oh. it's two burger patties topped with cheese, four bacon rashers, sandwiched between two glazed ring donuts. Wow. So, Andy, how many wow. calories do you think that is? 1,080. 1,080. <clears throat> that is correct. Okay. Anise? It's a cheeky thing. 1,081. <laughs> You were closer anyway. It's 1,996 calories. I was going to get 1,800, so Just damn. 2,000 calories. It, it, you know what it is? It's the glazing on the donut. People don't understand how <laughs> that glazing is just like an explosion. Really? <laughs> is that what it yeah. is? Well, I mean, it's a lot of things. It's also the bacon and everything else and the cheese. Of course, but. Yeah. The glazing, like if you compare a plain donut and a glazed donut, it's just like brah, like it just explodes. Mm. Calories, yeah. We're learning such a lot today. <laughs> so, Anais, what are, are we going to? What are we reading next week? We are reading *Exquisite Corpse* by Joshua Ferris, Jenny O'Phil, Mohsin Hamid, James Patterson, Alif Baduman, Rivka Galchin, Anthony Mara, Adele Waldman, Nicholson Baker, Arlstein, Hanya Yanagihara, David Baldacci, Rebecca Curtis, Ben Marcus, and Zadie Smith. Wow. <laughs> so... R.L. Stein. Yeah. Each, each submitting a paragraph. 
each submitting a paragraph. Wow. Also, I don't know if I said David. Is it Baldacci? I'm guessing because it's like two season. I think it is. Yes. Baldacci, yes. Baldacci, yes. Okay. That's what I guessed. All right. So that's what we're reviewing next week. I won't wow. read all the authors next week, though. <laughs> <laughs> or will I? All right. Of course you will. But before you go, tell us about your hunger-fueled crimes in our Facebook group, The Literary Roadhouse Readers, or Twitter at Literary Roadhouse, or our website, literaryroadhouse.com. Looking for more literary whimsy and Big Macs? Join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club, where we discuss a novel each month. This month, we're reading Black Leopard, Red Wolf by Marlon James. Michael B. Jordan recently bought the rights to make this movie, so read the book with us before the movie comes out. Uh, Andy, you might like that one, by the way. It's a fantasy novel, but instead of like the typical medieval England setting, it's Africa... So African setting fantasy. All right. By Michael B. Jordan, a.k.a. No, by Marlon J. Jordan. <coughs> oh, right. Movie. <laughs> the movie is Michael B. Jordan, yeah. who is not. Not the, that Michael Jordan. Right, but it's Killmonger <laughs> from Black Panther. Right. Right. So <laughs> lastly, we need to binge on fast food for curse busting reasons. Support our heart disease and podcast expenses at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with the bakery man forcing Wagner on you. Until next time, read a good story. <laughs>